So far, we've seen how genes are transmitted, where they're located, and how they work. But our next great discovery revealed a brand new surprise about what else genes can do. And it came from a surprising source. Meet Barbara McClintock, a woman who became one of the most distinguished scientists of the 20th century. To learn more about McClintock, I paid a visit to David Kirk, professor of biology at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. There's many, many things I'd like to ask you, but let me start with Barbara McClintock. She's a fabulous scientist, one really? of the world's best. But she faced a lot of challenges, right? Oh, she sure did. Partly because she was just too bright for most people and her mind went too fast. But even though she was a member of the academy, she couldn't, she was never offered an academic position, primarily because she's a woman. Also because she was so much brighter than any of her male colleagues that many people were afraid of her, afraid of her brain. In 1942, disenchanted by her lack of career advancement in the male-dominated field of genetics, McClintock went to work at the Cold Spring Harbor Lab in New York. It was here that McClintock made history. Working alone, she chose to research the genetics of maize. Of special interest to her was the genetic mechanism underlying the unique mosaic of colored kernels. It was while studying these that McClintock began to notice a correlation between the color of a kernel and a break that occurred in one of its chromosomes. The colors of the kernels corresponded to where on the chromosome the breaks occurred. A break in the chromosome occurred, she said, when a gene randomly jumped or transposed from one chromosome to another. When this happened, it disrupted the activity of the other genes responsible for producing the pigment of the kernel. Everybody at that time thought of chromosomes and genes as being very stable things, just transmitted from one generation to another. She found that certain genes she was trying to locate on the chromosomes would be in a different position at different times. In one corn plant, it would appear to be in one position in the chromosomes. In another corn plant, it would be in a different position. And a third corn plant might be in a third position. How could this be? A single gene, in different locations and different plants. And she made the intuitive leap that these genes were leaping, going from one place to another, which was totally unheard of at that time. She was the first person who really saw the kind of detail that's present in every chromosome. Literally the first person. She could look at a single kernel of corn and see the genes, see the chromosomes. She could look at the chromosomes and see the whole plant. She was incredible. Barbara McClintock's discovery of transposons was as evolutionary as it was revolutionary. While some genetic mutations caused by transposons are linked to cancer and other diseases, transposons may also be a mechanism that causes genes to mutate in response to changes in the environment and spur the evolution of a species. Today, we know that transposons exist in the genes of all living things, everything from algae to human beings. So my postdoctoral fellow, whose name was Steve Miller, came here specifically to try to find a transposon that could do what Barbara McClintock showed that transposons in corn could do. He finally found one that he could control the jumping of, and it jumped so well when he was interested in it that he named it after his basketball hero, Michael Jordan. <laughs> so we always keep a picture of Michael around the laboratory, slam dunking a ball box algae. Every basketball player's dream to, right, uh, right. to dunk algae. While Barbara McClintock never gained the fame of Michael Jordan, she did achieve her own notoriety. When she presented the findings of her research in 1951 at a Cold Spring Harbor symposium, her work was ignored and rejected. The experience made her so bitter that she never gave another lecture there, though she continued working at the lab until her death in 1992 at the age of 89. She did live long enough to be vindicated. 30 years after her pioneering discovery, McClintock was awarded the 1983 Nobel Prize for Medicine.